There is currently a violent struggle in every believer between the divine and the carnal. This is an accurate assessment of everyone who has been, been born again. Paul is not j only talking about himself. He's talking about all believers when he says that the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Now, just as the devil confronted Adam and Eve uh, in the garden... So does he still now confront every new creature that God has created in Christ Jesus. And that's what this struggle is, the flesh, between the flesh and the spirit. The devil has been cast out of heaven, so he's unable to mount a, any attack uh, directly on the Most High. But he, so he seeks to devour what the Most High has created. And so we see here that the dragon is persecuting the woman when the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Now, this, this is a revelation. In other words, this is something that has been made known from heaven, which means that it would not otherwise be known that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. This has not been discovered by man. This has not been found out by wisdom. It has been revealed. Revelation is always a divine initiative that God opened it up. Both the flesh and the spirit are competing for dominant presence and expression in men. Amen. Neither is willing to accommodate the other. Neither will follow. Both of these are rulers by nature. The flesh will not just take what it's given and be content. And the spirit will not stand by and take what's left. The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit lusts against the flesh. They cannot walk together because they are not agreed. These two are mortal enemies with no possibilities of truce or conditions of peace. The Holy Spirit asks us, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And what communion hath light with darkness? Mm -hmm. These two are essentially different. Mm -hmm. It's not that they just have disagreeable points. They're, they're opposed in nature, so they, they lust against one another. There are no common values. There are, there is no, there are no overlaps in their, in their preferences and likes and ways. They lust against one another. There's no consideration for the other. There's no pity or passivity extended between these two sides. And there, there's also no civility between the two. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Any more than the leopard can change its spots or the Ethiopian can change his skin. Now, we're given, we're given armor, armor to deal with this, yeah. to, to, to survive in this experience, this conflict. We're not given rubber gloves. We're given armor. Amen. We face a vicious and violent danger that can't be, it can't be confronted with new habits. Yeah. Not when the spirit's lusting against the flesh and the flesh lusts against the spirit. Yeah. That's like new habits. Are like, they're like child's play. The, the five spiritual disciplines are not going to suffice to survive this lusting of the spirit against the flesh. We're, we have to have armor. The people of God have to know that this conflict is going to continue as long as these bodies live or as long as the world stands. This conflict will exist in every believer. The people of God, they got to know this. If they're convinced of something else, then the existence of the conflict is going to be a major problem. Yes. The spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the spirit. There is no chance of the flesh reconsidering its ways. It's going to lust. That's all it can do is lust against the spirit. This conflict continues while the believer is being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This lusting happens at the same time. Yeah. So keep thy heart with all diligence, 
for out of it are the issues of life. Now, the flesh is commonly seen as being aggressive and demanding. The old man, the sinful nature, the, the part that we got from Adam, it, it's, it's more conspicuously demanding and aggressive. But the spirit isn't often seen as this way, but he is. The flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. This is, this is what caused me to like stop, like Moses stopped and turned to see that bush that was burning. When I, I read this, they're both lusting. They both are. The spirit is, the, see, we're all very familiar, firsthand familiar with, with the demands of the flesh. Well, I, I don't want to be guilty of thinking that the spirit asks less than the flesh does. The spirit is lusting against the flesh the spirit is often thought of as just always being there just in case people want to do good and then he'll he's there to help people think of of god as that that divine gentle giant who wouldn't hurt a flea and would never impose himself upon people but he's always ready to help i mean people never say it that way but isn't that how they think he wants the best for everyone, and he only speaks kind words of comfort and encouragement, but the Spirit lusts against the flesh. Amen. He doesn't just stand by and hope, and hope that you pray and, and hope that you make the right decision. He's lusting against the flesh. I think that, see, the, fle- the, this, the way of the flesh is more conspicuous because we're, we're in a, a world that is filled with wickedness and we're in bodies that, um, that, are, that are condemned. And, but see, you get, uh, you, you get sensitive to the Spirit and, you, and tuned in to that, that, that voice that the Spirit uses and you realize uh, the Spirit is not going to accept less than what the flesh does. Amen. That just doesn't make any sense, does it? Amen. The Spirit lusts against the flesh. The human race is actually more suited for the expression and presence of the Holy Spirit than they are for sin. We're created by God and in His image, sin and Satan are the intruders among men. Very, They are the foreign occupation. This text of Galatians 5.17 is followed by these two famous lists of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And so these, see, these are like the agendas of when the flesh lusts, that these, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. See, that's what he's working for. These are the expression of his his ways and of his nature. But the fruit of the Spirit, see, that's that's what is... The, the Holy Spirit is laboring to, to establish and to, and to mature and to grow in, in people. And so these two, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, that's what, is lust, that's what are lusting against, yeah. against one another. So the flesh and the Spirit are both expressive. The flesh expresses these works. The, fruit express, or the Spirit expresses these fruits. And both are aggressive uh, to advance their ways. Each are opposed to the ways and the nature of others, and each are, each are also suppressed by the presence of the other. Both are. Mm-hmm. Now, here's some examples to illustrate this, the, 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 the presence of this, of this conflict. Isaac and Ishmael, they were in the same family, and they are, they are like ancient commentary on this yeah. lusting of the flesh against the spirit Amen. and the spirit against the flesh. He that was born after the flesh, that's Ishmael. Yeah. He persecuted him that was born after yeah. the spirit. Yeah. Even so it is now. Now this is not just merely a, a, a family feud. This is not, this is not a instruction on, on how, to, how to raise your children. Not, it, not Isaac and Ishmael. This is not the right text. This is not just uh, an example of sibling rivalry. This is a touchstone of the eternal purpose of God in its early days of maturing. That's what Isaac and, Isaac and Ishmael are. 
There was strife in the house. There was even mocking. There was envy. There was even favoritism in the, in the house between children. In the same house with the same father. And listen, it wasn't right to quell the conflict. The conflict was actually right. It was right that these two be in conflict with one another. He would not be, Ishmael would not be the heir with the, son, with the son of the free woman. The conflict was right. There was no grounds of peace between Isaac and Ishmael, and there's no grounds of peace between the flesh and the spirit. <clears throat> Only one could stay in the house. One had to go. Only one could be heir. This, this same drama on a great, grander scale is being lived out again in everyone that is born of the spirit. Another example of this, in the same bloodline is Jacob and Esau. <clears throat> Isaac and Ishmael shared a house. Jacob and Esau shared a womb. This stri the strife between Jacob and Esau continued until their adult life. In Genesis chapter 25, this was <clears throat> Rachel, the mother of these twin boys, sensed that there was something. This is like not a normal pregnancy. And so in Genesis 25, 22, the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. That was a revelation, wasn't it? Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. That was a revelation. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. Did you hear that? The one people, shall, they, weren't be, they would not be equal. That's right. They would be opposed, but they would not be equal. That's right. One shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger against nature. Yeah. That's not natural. Yeah. The elder shall serve the younger. Now, these two men, Jacob and Esau, were very, very different. Yeah. Even in appearance, one was hairy and one was, uh, was fair-skinned. One was a hunter, and one dwelled in tents. One was profane, and one was chosen. Amen. Now, these are divine distinctions. I'm not just making these up. Amen. One was loved, and the other was hated. Yes. And that's a revelation. Amen. And the scripture even makes, he drive, dr to drive home this point, that this, is, <clears throat> this, was, this was done before they did either good or evil. One was loved. Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Now, God will be justified in all of his sayings. I know they, men, a lot of men have tried to get God in trouble over this. <clears throat> and God's going to turn the tables on them. As God will be justified in, in all of his sayings. See, so Isaac and, and Ishmael, they, they were an example to us of this this lusting of the flesh and spirit in you, and Jacob and Esau, they, they, they hold like a little different testimony, but about they're both testifying of what's going on in the believer. And I, I conclude by this, at least we need to know about what's going on. Yes, amen. The presence of the Canaanites in the promised land is another example to us of the, the lusting of the flesh and the spirit. Amen. Fighting to possess what God gives. Yeah. It's part of the design. A lot of the Israelites were just astonished. They got to this promised land, they, and it, it, there was somebody else in there. And they had to drive them out. They had to fight for what God gave them. They were shocked. Well, they, they, those people have a large following even today. Yeah. The presence of enemies in the promised land gave occasion for God to teach the people, yeah. for God to reveal his ways, for an occasion for people to trust in God and to see the salvation of God, and it's the same today. Amen. The evil aggression of the flesh is also seen in Cain killing Abel, yeah. first generation, yeah. the first generation that was born right. <clears throat> of that wicked one. Moses found himself between the treasures of Egypt and the recompense of the reward. And these were like lusting, both for Moses. Moses had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Even, even Daniel in the lion's den is sort of a parable 
of this, this child of God, Daniel, being dropped into the, into the den of lions, and the, the lions couldn't hurt him. Yeah. Now, the lions were still lions. They didn't, like, turn into little house cats after, after Daniel was dropped into the den. They were still lions. There was a this difference in, in nature. There was still this danger, but see, God, God was superintending yeah. Yeah. this coexistence of Daniel and the lion. <clears throat> now, the, I want to affirm with some examples here the, the lusting of the flesh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hasten through this because, like I said, it's, this, is, this is more conspicuous. This, is, this, doesn't, take, this doesn't require the, the time of exposition as the lusting of the spirit, I believe, does. But the lusting of the flesh is confirmed in the flood of Noah, in the, the, the condition of the world when God sent the flood. And this is the divine commentary that they only, uh, they were only evil continually. See, that's the, see the aggression of the flesh in that. And also that after the flood, sin continued. That's, the, that's further commentary on the ways, the ways of the flesh. Another example of this is that uh, the men of Sodom, when they came to Lot's house that night and demanded, not knowing that they, these were angels, and they demanded the men that came into to Lot's house, and they were struck blind, and they continued, Amen. they continued blind. Now, wouldn't you think if, if you were struck blind in the midst of your error, yeah. you think that would change how you thought? Uh -huh. yeah. It didn't. No. So you see the, the flesh lusting. Against, against the spirit. The Israel in the wilderness is another commentary of this. They just, they just had their, their eyes were just filled with incredible miracles. And the first chance they had to complain and grumble, they did it. That, that's the flesh lust against the spirit. How about the men who saw the angels descend on the tomb of Jesus and they actually told the, what actually happened to the rulers of the Jews, and they all agreed together to lie about it. Now, isn't that commentary on the flesh? The flesh lusting against the spirit. You'd think, boy, as, as, many, as much as people want to see a miracle, those keepers of the tomb should have been converted. They should have been the first preachers of the resurrection, right? But no, not even angelic presence is going to change the way of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit. Even in the presence of angelic creatures, the flesh lusts against the spirit. See, that all, these things kind of sharpen our vision in what Jesus said, that you must be born again. You don't. Don't marvel at this, that you must be born again. God can bless and bless and bless, and flesh doesn't change. God can, can, he can judge and judge and judge, and flesh doesn't, doesn't change. He can send kings and judges and prophets and miracles, and flesh doesn't change. Yeah. Marvel not that you must be born again. What about Judas? Yeah. Judas lusted yes. against the spirit, if you will, yeah. in the inner circle of yeah. Jesus right to the very end was lusting against the flesh, against the spirit. Consider, just as an example, the demon possessions that are uh, articulated for us in the scriptures, in the gospels particularly, they involve men and women and children. So these evil influences, like they don't, they don't care. They, they, have, they have no respect for, for gender or for age or for, for race one drove a man to cut himself and to break chains. Another threw a child into fire and water to destroy him. One made a man blind and deaf. Now I ask, in, the, in contrast to all of these possessions of, of wicked spirits, is the Holy Spirit's presence in a man less powerful? Does the Spirit have less influence on people as he transforms them into the image of God, does he have less influence than these wicked spirits? Is the Holy Spirit content to have less control of a person than a demon does, even against the person's will? 
the chief example, <clears throat> I believe, of the lusting of the flesh against the spirit is the rejection and crucifixion of Jesus. The created rejected the creator. The one who has life in himself, the only man who ever walked in this world who had life in himself, that one was judged to be worthy of death. That's the, the flesh lusting yeah, against the spirit. He in whom Satan had nothing, nothing, none, none of us can say that. Jesus said, he hath nothing in me. That one in whom Satan had nothing was accused of having a devil. That's the flesh lusting against the spirit. He is, he that was made unto us wisdom was accused by men of being mad. He's made unto us wisdom. Light came into the world, but men loved darkness. See, that's the divine commentary on the flesh lusting against the spirit. Now, I want to land on this phrase, the spirit lusts against the flesh. Now, I want to say that this is good news. Amen. This is the God. We've been talking about the gospel so much lately. Of course, with the, with the renewal and leading up to the renewal and then the, the, the glory that follows, the afterglow of the, of the renewal, there's been, there's been more sensitivity about, about the gospel. I'm saying that this Galatians 5.17 is a word of gospel. That the flesh lusts against the spirit, we all, we, we all can relate to that. And then the gospel comes to bear. The spirit lusts against the flesh. Are they, that's what we need. Yes. That is exactly what we need. We need the, the spirit to lust against the flesh. Now, the, the lusting of the spirit is the local extension of the high priesthood of Jesus. This is local personal evidence that he ever lives to make intercession for us, that the spirit lusts against the flesh. No man has ascended up to see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We cannot confirm in the lab or with DNA testing or photographic technology or anything of the sorts that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God, but that the spirit lusts against the flesh. In, the, in a way, these are the same work, the spirit lusting against the flesh and Jesus appearing at the right hand of God for us. Because God is not willing that any law be lost, the Lord Jesus, he's, he made the Lord Jesus to ever live to make intercession for us, and the spirit lusts against the flesh in us. He appears for us, the spirit lusts in us. That's why I say that the, the lusting of the spirit is like the, it's like the local evidence yes. of his intercession in heaven Amen. for us. Amen. Jesus said that he had to ascend to the Father in order to send the spirit. Yeah. He, had this, this, he had to comfort the apostles. They were just distraught. Yeah. And he said, I go away to my Father. And they, he must, they, they must have had that look on their face. You, know, the, yeah. you get the people that they didn't have to say anything. They said it all with their face and didn't have to use any words. And so Jesus said, I go to my father, and, they, and he saw that look. Of course, he didn't, Jesus didn't have to have the look. He knew, what, was, he knew that what they were thinking anyways. But then he comforted him. He said, it's better for you that I go away. They couldn't conceive. of When he said that, I'd imagine that they, they were probably thinking of all of these questions that were brought. And they probably thought, I'm glad Jesus answered that. And so they were thinking, how can it be better that Jesus go away? They, couldn't, they just couldn't imagine the, the, the teaching and the miracles and the casting out and the praying and the, how could it be better that Jesus go away and Jesus open up if I go not away the comforter shall not come yeah. but if I go away I will send him yeah. so his presence there yes. is what makes it possible for the spirit to be here yes. and so the lusting of the, of the spirit against the flesh here proves that he's standing there Amen. for us right. the spirit lusts against the flesh so, brethren, it takes both a heavenly presence and an earthly presence to save a man. Amen. We've, got to, we've got to have full representation to make a, make a clean escape out of this condemned world. Now, by, by way of, of a definition, 
lust is not always evil. And I think a lot of people make the, you know, quickly make that association. But love is not always good either. The lust of other things that enter in, that is evil. But so is love when it's loving the praise of man. Lust, love, envy, and hate are all capacities that can be defiled by sin and they can be sanctified by grace. So the spirit lusts against the flesh. James chapter 4 verse 5 is almost a parallel text to Galatians 5.17. James 5.4. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? The Lord is not interested in sharing you with the world. The spirit lusteth Amen. to envy. Amen. You would be opposed to your spouse only living with you part of the time. Amen. That's because you lust to envy, right. right? I want to read this in, in a couple different versions. I found it beneficial. This is the new century version of, Rome, of uh, James 4, 5. Do you think the scripture means nothing that says, the spirit that God made to live in us wants us for himself alone. Amen. And the spirit has a right. Yes. Amen. He has a right to have us for himself yes. alone. Uh-huh. Now here's the Amplified. This is one of, my, um, one, one, of, one of my favorite commentaries, is to read the Amplified version. I, I, I enjoy it. Or do you suppose that the scripture is speaking to no purpose that says the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us yearns over us and he yearns for the spirit to be welcome with a jealous love? For the spirit to be welcome. Well, what what makes the spirit not welcome? The, The presence of the flesh. The lusting of the flesh. The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. There's going to be a day, brethren, in the world to come that we'll be able to to look back and and sum up the the time that Jesus was bringing many sons to glory, and we'll be able to identify with great specificity and perfect understanding all of those experiences that we had that are only explainable by the Spirit of God lusting to envy we, we can't now I- identify with 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 a full understanding then we shall know even as we are known Th- this will result in a in great praise and glory to God because you're, you will be able to connect certain deliverances and certain advances with that. that the spirit was lusting to envy. Yeah. All those times where we, we thought that we, um, we, we, we grew because we, 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 we got up earlier in the morning to pray. And we thought that, that's why we made that. No, it was the spirit lusting to envy. And that's why you wanted to get up earlier to pray. Because the spirit was lusting to envy. Now, here's some, here's some ways in which the, the spirit lusts to envy. Romans chapter 8 says, as, as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, you see, that di- there, there's different kinds of leaders, you know. There's people who lead, and then there's people who lead. Now, the, the, he, that, he that is led by the spirit. Now, just connect the leading of the spirit with him lusting to envy. I think the spirit is an aggressive leader. Amen. Here's another example, 2 Corinthians 3, that we are transformed by the spirit into the same image. So the Holy Spirit's work is, is, is changing, transforming, making the old old and making the new mature, transforming, making us like whom we are looking. That, see, the, as, as the, the transformation work continues, just see that that defines that the spirit is lusting to envy. 
This is his work. 1 Corinthians 12. He says, uh, talking about the assembly, talking about how the, now we, you know, we, we make a schedule, right? So we, o- we open up the paper and we, this is, this is what we're going to do. Well, actually the, the spirit manages the assembly That's right. and he, yeah. he gives by the spirit, he gives a word of wisdom. Uh-huh. Now this is first Corinthians 12 and by the same spirit, he gives a word of prophecy Amen. Yes. and the, the same spirit, he gives a word of knowledge. So when, when something comes home to you, why did it come home? It's just because it, somebody's been studying extra hard this week? No, the Spirit gave it. Amen. And he, it's because he's lusting to envy. Right. Yeah. And interpretation of tongues. He, oh, he gave the tongues too. And faith and miracles. And here's the, here's the explanation of all these things that, that he has given. He gives to all severally as he wills. Amen. Now, I, I don't want to have a problem with that. No. I, w- I want to be able to say amen. To amen. He, he gives all these things severally as he wills. In all of the working of the Spirit in these ways, he is desiring your heart. That's right. he's, de- he's after your minds. Yeah. He's lusting against the Spirit, against the flesh. Yeah. And he lusts against what lusts against him. Yeah. I mean, this is... This is part of the work is that, you know, staving off the enemy and taking the land. Now, here's another uh, definition, a little more uh, particular. A definition of lust is to set the heart upon. It's to set, when you set your heart on something, it's lust. So it's not only bad. It can be for sure, but it can also be good. Like uh, the same as the word covet, right? Well, thou shalt not covet, but then the Holy Spirit says, covet the best gifts. See, that's that's a capacity of desire that can be defiled or sanctified. Another another definition of lust, intensely crave possession. Now think about the spirit lusting after the flesh. He is intensely craving possession of your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit and your body. Intensely crave possession. Earnestly desire greatly. I like those stringing adjectives. (laughs) Also passion and also fierce. That's actual, I mean, I I don't want to like wax wise here, but that's actually a Greek definition of lust uh-huh. is fierce uh-huh. yeah. see it's an aggressive right, yeah. an aggressive pursuit That's right, yeah. see again we know by experience that the that the flesh this is the way of the flesh is this aggressive fierce pursuit <laughs> brethren we need to know that the spirit not only matches but he supersedes yes. That's right, yeah. Amen. the lusting of the flesh And this word envy from James 4, verse 5, envy has to do with jealous. And envy and jealous, again, are those words that can can be animated by evil and good. Jealous or discontent, desire, once again. God has a right to our hearts and our minds. The spirit lusteth to envy. He's not going to watch quietly as men give themselves to others. The Lord's name is jealous. Now, I think that it would only be like an an essential part of his character and nature to call his name something. Like, he he doesn't say, the Lord's name is wrath. The Lord's name is jealous. He does have wrath, but that's not his name. His name is is jealous and he is a jealous god this is found several times in scripture the lord told uh hosea he said uh, that israel he would he would hedge up their way with thorns because they were they were wandering they were wandering away from him he would hedge up their way with thorns in other words he would make it hard for them to wander away from him because he's jealous he's not gonna just raise his hands and shake his head and say, what a pity. 
He's jealous. And the spirit lusts against the flesh. So don't interpret the Lord's long suffering as pacifism. If Jesus spews out someone from his mouth because they were neither cold nor hot, it is only after there was much jealous lusting to envy before they were spewed out. Paul was jealous over the Corinthians with a godly jealousy. David confronted Goliath not just because he had a hankering for a fight. It was because he was jealous for the name of the Lord. Nehemiah left his post by request of the king to rebuild the walls of the ruined, broken-down city of Jerusalem, not because of his just uh, because he it just hurt him so bad to see his home country and that because of it, the, it was the city of God. He had he was jealous for the name of God for the city of God. See, all of these men they exhibited the jealousy of God. The jealousy of God for Corinth, it came through Paul. The jealousy of God for his name, it came through David when he killed Goliath. The jealousy of God for Jerusalem, it was expressed through Nehemiah. He is a jealous God. These men were close enough to God that God could funnel his nature through these men. He is a jealous God. That's why the spirit lusts against the flesh. Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That was a revelation too. Saul of Tarsus couldn't uh, give an exposition of this internal experience that he had. Saul undoubtedly knew that this, things are getting harder. Something, there's some kind of straight, straightening influence here. I can't, I'm just, I'm not, I can't just keep going like I've been going. There's something going on. It, he didn't know he was kicking against the pricks. Jesus appears to him and said, Saul, Saul, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And Paul, after uh, some time, uh, in one of his uh, defenses, he, he recounted that. And he verbatim, he quoted what Jesus told him. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Well, that, that prick was the spirit lusting against the flesh in Saul of Tarsus. Here's another example of the spirit lusting against the flesh. Satan desired Peter. Peter didn't know it. I don't think anybody else knew it either. Only Jesus. Now this is, this is a good, that was a revelation, wasn't it? That nobody knew this until Jesus said it. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired thee to have thee, to sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. So there you have the the lusting of the flesh and the lusting of the spirit. The flesh is what Satan has access to to work through, and the spirit is what Jesus has access to to work uh, through. <clears throat> and so here's here's how it played out that night. The, the the flesh lusted when that young girl said, "Weren't you with him?" That was the that was the flesh lusting. And, and, and Peter, see, he was, he's in the midst of this conflict now. Now, remember what Brother, uh, Brother uh, Given has affirmed to us with, uh, in the account of Abraham and others as well. Faith is evaluated after the test. And so the flesh is lusting against, against Peter and says, w weren't you with him? And that happened three times. And now <clears throat> Jesus, the cock crowed three times, Peter remembered. Jesus turned and looked. He just looked at him. Amen. That was the flat, the spirit lusting Amen. for Peter. Amen. Peter responded. Amen. The good shepherd. See, Peter is, is, is an example of all believers in this way. Now, our experience is not guaranteed to be exactly like Peter's in, any more than it is uh, going to be exactly like Paul's or exactly like David's, or exactly like Moses. But it's, it's an example to us yes. that the, 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 the Satan, he pursued Peter, uh -huh. and Jesus pursued Peter, yes. and who won? Amen. Look who won. Amen. The good shepherd went to deliver his lamb from the mouth of the lion, yes. just like David did. Now, here's, an, here's another good word of, of gospel in this regard. 
God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able to bear, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Yes. Now, I suggest that that is an example of the lusting of the flesh against the spirit and the lusting of the spirit against the flesh. Every, that's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Every time that you are tempted, the spirit lusts against it. Yes. Every time. And I, I affirm, brethren, that if he didn't, we would fall. If he didn't. He never misses a confrontation. Demas didn't find the way of escape. That's why he went back to the world. But it was there. It was there. Those in Sardis that did not defile their garments, they didn't defile them because they kept finding the way of escape. That's why. The flesh lusted against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And see, God is superintending this. Yes. And every time, he's making sure that the lusting is not more than you can bear. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And every time, he's making sure there's a way of escape. Yes. Every time. Amen. That is gospel. Yes. That's why we're still believing today, because God has made a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Amen. If the Lord just turned and looked the other way the next time you were tempted, we know what the outcome would yes. be. Now, just right before our text in Galatians 5.17, just right before it, the Holy Spirit said, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Amen. For the spirit, the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to the one to the other uh -huh. so that you cannot do the things that you would. That doesn't mean it's a stalemate mm -hmm. so that you cannot do the things that you would. doesn't mean it's a stalemate. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I mean, you cannot do the things that you would is that you want to be clothed upon with, with immortality. That's that we cannot do. That's what he means. But they cannot do the things that we would. It doesn't mean I just I want to trust God, but I can't. I want to serve God, but I can't. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying I, we can't yet be free from the influence of the flesh. That's it. That's it. Amen. The Holy Spirit is fully capable of conquering your flesh. This is like not even a contest. It's a contest for us, not for him. Yeah. The pending issue is you and me, not flesh and spirit. Right after our text, Galatians 5:18 says, "But if you be led of the Spirit, you shall if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law." And see, you see so you, we find these bookends on either side of our text. If you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. He didn't say if the Spirit leads. If you be led. That's a lot different. Because the Spirit doesn't fail to lead. He lusteth to envy. The issue is if you're led. That's right. If you follow, if you hear, if you respond. Uh -huh. where, so where do those, those, those uh, heavenly thoughts come from of, of pressing in? Where do they come from? If you be led of the Spirit. Yes. That's where they come Amen. from. Now I want to give a word <clears throat> uh, before I conclude here to expose some lies in this regard. This, this text, the Galatians 5.17, has, has no place in some doctrines afoot today, or at least it would require some modifications, you know, to kind of fit it in. Many people are unaware of this coexistence of flesh and spirit, which results in this constant struggle and therefore results in confusion about the struggle. What about those who say that the flesh is dead and gone, which is a very popular view of Romans chapter 6, that those in Christ are no longer confronted with the sinful nature, that Romans 6 ends the presence of the sinful nature, and Romans 7, it must have just been out of order, because Romans 7 is only the experience of the unconverted. That's a very common view. It's a serious danger to read in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and then conclude that all believers are presently done confronting with the sinful nature. That's what they've concluded because they said the body of sin is destroyed, Romans 6, 6. So they conclude it's gone, it's done, we're over. <clears throat> then what is wrestling with the old man? What is this battle of the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh? Destroyed is not the same as removed. Destroyed does not mean eradicated. The sinful nature has, in crucifixion and burial with Christ, has been deposed as the ruling authority in the believer. Amen. 
He has not yet been removed. He's been deposed. It has been, he has been dethroned like the, like the kings that were, that were tied up in Israel. The rulers of Israel, Joshua told them to put their foot on the necks of the kings. See, that's, they were still kings, but their king, they were deposed from their kingdom. Like the thief on the cross was condemned but still railing with his mouth. We still deal with the railing of the flesh and must mortify the deeds of the body. Like the Canaanites dwelling in the promised land that belongs to Israel, we are fighting to drive out the ones who have already been condemned. Amen. This is why Paul found evil present with him when he willed to do good. This lie that we are presently done with the sinful nature opens men up to being crushed under every temptation. If I am being tempted then I am still accessible to the sinful nature. And if, that, if I am accessible to the sinful nature, then it must mean that I'm not born again. You see how these, these thoughts perpetuate. The conflict of the flesh and the spirit, which actually confirms the new birth, has been thus turned into a, map, a weapon of mass destruction against those who have heard this lie. And likewise, those who are teaching, <clears throat> there are them that teach that sinful living is normal for the child of God and that the new, that the new covenant is a provision for our constant sinning. See, it's like extreme opposites. And we're just like those Israelites. It's just that we're forgiven. Well, that sounds like a glorious gospel, doesn't it? We're just like the world. We're only, we're only forgiven. This suggests that... that um, and even requires that there's been a basic na basic change in God. That if they're, they're, we're just like the sinners, except, except only if we're forgiven, uh, that he must no longer hate iniquity and that he does now, in fact, have fellowship with the throne of iniquity. And I guess in the end, if they're right, then God's going to have to apologize for the generation of Noah. Well, just a closing word of encouragement i want you to be encouraged by this conflict the lusting of the flesh against the spirit i want you to be encouraged by it because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world i want you to be encouraged by it that we're not left to scrap with the flesh on our own the spirit is lusting against the flesh i want you to take comfort in the warfare in the warfare, take comfort. In the fact that there's warfare in you, take comfort that there, don't be distraught by it. Take comfort that there's this warfare in you because Jesus has already overcome the world. Take comfort in the warfare because it actually confirms that God has begun a good work in you. And if he has begun it, he'll complete it. So this is not a contest of smarts and wits. It's the lusting of the flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The contest actually pivots on whom you yield to. Know you not that you are servants to, to him whom you yield yourself, servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey. So I encourage you that the, the battle is won by those whom, who yield to the spirit. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness and unto eternal life. Yeah. So I encourage you to be faithful unto the end.